Right? I think like it's a big problem. We have like 4,300 startups, right, uh, trying to sell products, right? 4,300 cybersecurity companies, not all startups, trying to sell uh, security products to a buyer within the organization, right? And what we are building at Whiteboard Venture Partners is a community which actually puts the founders at the center of design partners, early adopters, advisors, investors who need to be on that value creation journey early on, right? And so the objective of the panel is to actually discover what are these challenges uh, that have kind of shaped your behaviors of like how you interact with startups. Do you actually trust them to actually solve your needs? If you have an approach, and how are you actually manifesting your past experiences to what you want to do in the future in terms of how you want to collaborate? Uh, we've, we've shared an agenda. I don't think we'll have time for all the questions, but I'll spend like 10 minutes on, you know, talking about the past experiences that you have, 10 on like what you have been doing currently, and then 10 for the future. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Does that sound good? All right. Well, the first question is the easiest question. Can you give us a glimpse of when was your, what was your first experience working with a cybersecurity startup to achieve an outcome in your organization? And we can go down this way from Rinky. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first one that comes to mind for me was um, now a company called CoFence. Um, oh. used to be called FishMe. Uh, I remember doing business with them about 10 years ago or so. Um, and that was my first experience, I think, working with a startup company. And working with a startup company that solved really well in the banking industry and doing phishing testing um, and in really kind of um, making that important as a part of security education and awareness at companies but also a startup that hadn't yet started in the retail area i was at a retail company at the time and so um, that was kind of their first leg in with uh with a retail company and how you would do phishing testing there and so had a really interesting experience um with with them because it wasn't a successful program uh when we rolled it out at, um, because the company didn't feel like it was fit within the culture at the time and it wasn't well uh, you know, received, I think even in industry, it was a new concept of, to do phishing testing back then. Um, and so uh, where we landed with it was it was a big flop. It didn't roll out. But the way that the vendor um, worked with me, the way that Fish Me worked with me, I've been a customer now for every company that I've been been at. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, because I remember they sat with me. It wasn't about the money. They really wanted to show success and do right by me. Um, and so we ran the program for another year. They didn't charge me for it. They wanted to make it successful. Um, and I, I, you know, I'll continue taking them everywhere I go. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, I think if Fish Me is hearing this, they, they, <laughs> they have yeah. a good proponent here. Yeah. <laughs> Martin, how about yourself? Well, I think for me, the, the very first experience I had working with cybersecurity startups was actually not so much as a buyer, mm -hmm. but it was actually when I ran a partnership program at Microsoft. Okay. So over there, um, I ran this program called the Microsoft Active Protections Program, where we actually, as Microsoft, shared some vulnerability information with cybersecurity companies. Mm -hmm. So they could then build detection and go and protect their customers. And when you looked at sort of the, the mapping of companies in, in sort of areas of, of business, you would see that a lot of those actually were startups. They were companies that were just getting started, that were building a new detection technology. And even though probably the majority of the really good input that we got from the companies came from the really big ones, as in they would see an attack happening in the wild and they would give us some information that there was something new happening and we might need to do something like release a security update or release guidance to customers. The majority probably came from the big ones, but it was actually the startups, the smaller companies where I felt we built built the deepest relationships. And those companies brought two things to bear that I think the, the larger ones had issues with. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them was the depth of what they were doing in a particular area. So we worked with startups that were building brand new technology that was doing something very different. Like they may have been scanning the internet for malicious websites, for mm -hmm. instance. Um, and they would give us very deep data in that area. At the same time, though, the geographical distribution was also really interesting. I'll never forget that over there we had uh, quite a few startups actually in uh, Korea mm -hmm. that were members. And they were very quiet until mm -hmm. one day I flew there and I met with all of them in one week. It was a 
crazy week of going from building to building and in Seoul it's not always that easy to get around mm -hmm. and I met with all of the companies and after that initial meeting we started building really deep relationships and suddenly we got a lot of data on what was happening in Korea and wow. so those two things the depth of expertise that these companies had and the geographical distribution of them really focusing on a particular area was something that was really valuable and something that I always started looking to startups for right. uh, as of that moment. That's very interesting. Kevin, how has uh, how was your first experience working with one of them? Um, my first experience was kind of interesting. So uh, a long time ago, uh, a galaxy far, far away, I used to be a civil service employee for the government. Um, and uh, I had a pretty interesting job. Uh, one of my jobs was to work for the Secretary of the Army, and my focus was on business transformation. So we were looking at large companies and small companies that were doing innovative things from a, from a, from a business perspective. So redoing how, how the Army does their finance, redoing how they do ERP, with a focus on, on innovative ways to solve problems. Um, as I was doing this, I was using all kind of old-fashioned, traditional security things to secure stuff, and it just wasn't good enough. Um, so I thought like, hey, if, we're, if I'm focusing on, on these startups and large companies from a business perspective, like why shouldn't I be doing this from a security perspective? Um, so then, uh, you know, I kind of, I, I started reaching out to, to some of them and, and, and I reached out to some, some, some people to say, hey, like I'm looking for different types of security technologies that are more nimble than, you know, all the big names at the time, whatever they are, you know, Cisco and, and whoever, whoever the big names were back in the, in the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, you know, so then we start, started reaching out, uh, you know, and started, started talking to some and, uh, you know, um, much difference dealing with the, with the, with the small uh, startups that, uh, you know, the responses were quicker. Um, if I asked a question, like the next day they showed me the feature in the product, like it was, it was phenomenal, especially being a government employee and working government projects, right? The fact they can turn things around uh, in a day or two, in a week or two, and when they made a promise, they actually made their commitments, like, it, uh, like I, was, I was blown away. Um, so um, ever since ever since then, um, you know, I've I've really um, kind of embraced uh, working with uh, with uh, with uh, startups, and I always call myself when I was, when I start talking to them, I'm like, hey, like I'm an early adopter, CISO. I'm always, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm looking for the early startups. I'm looking for those early companies, um, and I, I pride myself in, in, in hopefully finding finding good ones to help me solve problems quickly. So. That's awesome. Um, how about you, John? So my first experience was with a database scanning company back in the early 2000s. So this was the era when uh, databases would install as admin without a password, just be listening on the network, um, show of hands who remembers those days. Uh, or Oracle would be every month releasing updates with uh, hundreds and hundreds of security fixes. So this company produced this tool that would scan your database but the unique selling point was that it would actually include uh, vulnerabilities that were found by the researchers. Vulnerabilities that were essentially zero day, that they had found in the product, say Oracle or SQL Server, reported to the vendor, but for which there weren't any patches available yet. So uh, that was deemed a selling point. But what actually a, a lot of customers that use this, um, they, they looked at the tool and said, well, there's, there's no workaround, there's no patch, and there's no workaround. So we actually don't really want that piece of information. We don't want to know about the zero days. We want to use your tool as a compliance tool just to say, you know, is our database mostly um, healthy from a security perspective? Um, and this company uh, took that feedback on board, and the initial response was, what do you mean you're using it as a <laughs> compliance tool? That's not the way you're supposed to use our product. No, have, have the zero days. Um, so it was really interesting to see. I, I actually saw this firsthand. A bit of a spoiler, I worked for that company, the, the database scanning company, so I got to see this conversation play out. And it's just really fascinating to see where we had enterprise customers telling us, this is how we want to use your product, this is the gap in the market, this is, you know, this is how we can use your solution. And then initially the sort of pushback of, this is not what we had in mind, like surely everyone wants to know these zero days, and surely everyone wants our, um, our, our remediation steps that really won't work and haven't been tested in enterprise. We, so it was really a fascinating time to, to work for that company and, and see them evolve. Oh, that's awesome, right? Classic pivoting of like what you meant to actually build versus what the market actually wants, right? How about you, Dave? Can you close us out with the story? Yeah, so my experience is probably uh, a little bit more unique because my first foray was when I actually had a startup myself. Yeah. And um, our, our technology, so this was back in the late 90s, we were working with companies like Hewlett Packard, Toshiba, Equifax, eventually for doing uh, customer data acquisition. 
So if you bought an inkjet printer from HP in the late 90s, early 2000s, you were using that technology. Uh, one of the key challenges we had was this was personal data. So it was at a time when the US probably wasn't so concerned about data privacy, but the EU was. And, uh, and our products, of course, were going worldwide, 83 countries, 22 languages. So I had to be able to secure this data in all formats, not just electronically, but printed, because we were looking at printing this, uh, this information onto a sheet of paper, which we would then receive and then have it uh, scanned in. So I was able to work with a company out of Israel that had been affiliated with the uh, military, and they had some technology that could translate electronic information into uh, a digital image. It looked a lot like a QR code that we, we know very well now, but um, at the time they were the only ones who could do it because they were transmitting really sensitive information for the military over fax. So we licensed an agreement with them where we were able to take that information, put it into an image, and uh, it allowed us to basically create a, a, an automated way to get this information from a printed page into electronic format very easily. So not only was it innovative in, in a secure way of being able to protect the data, but we reduced the amount of time to process all of these um, individual printed uh, registration cards, basically where you know companies like HP would spend tens of thousands of dollars a year in people time, uh, we could reduce that in a matter of like hours. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Well, if, and I was just checking on my time, like we're on track. Uh, we should talk about what we're doing presently, right? And part of what I'm hoping to get from the panel is like, do you, I mean, I generally get a positive vibe, right? Like that you all like working with cybersecurity startups. What I'm probably looking for is like, what kind of startups are bringing something in their offering? Maybe it's the team, maybe it's something else. What is your selection criteria where there are certain deal breakers that entrepreneurs need to know about what the buyer might be careful about, right? As in like, as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, probably too early, not for me, right? And do you have like a set of things that you've actually created on your checklist between deal breakers or processes within your organizations, right? To actually select startups on who you want to be working with, right? What is that process like today as you work? If you're working with any startup, if you want to give an example, that'd be awesome. So Dave, let's go back. And yeah, let's, sure. Let's so, you. Uh, you know, I like working with a lot of the smaller companies and the startups because they tend to be a lot more agile. Um, you know, with the bigger companies, you kind of get, here's here's your set, you know, A, B, C, this is what you can apply to your environment, and you don't get a lot of flexibility to customize, so then you end up spending tons of money in professional services. So the, the startups really give us a, a really good working relationship whereby we have a, a, a good feedback loop. So we, we see enough promise in what they start with, and then we start to say, hey, we, we need to get uh, X, Y, Z added to it, and they can turn around very quickly. The places that I see startups falling down is kind of over-promising and under-delivering. And, and generally that happens because they're maybe a little bit aggressive in their uh, estimations of how long it's going to take to actually get some of these new features in place. And because of that, it ends up spending more time with our, our teams, and then that time is money. And then ultimately, it just creates this huge headache where we have to either change our priorities with projects or we have to you know, find a different solution. So in general, I think it, it's a good relationship to have with companies as long as they have the resources. Um, generally what I've seen is that you, you come down to maybe one or two key points that are sort of the high priority deal breaker item, and it's just timing. Most mm -hmm. of them can accommodate, but not within a time frame. John, like, um are there like some best practices that you actually use to communicate with startups like when you're engaging them? Like Yeah, so I'm going to name a couple of specifics that are deal breakers for me. Um, the first one is API access. So if you look at a, look at a lot of startups, um, the API is a second class citizen. It's promised at some sometime Q4 next year. Uh, and uh, if you think about how we use a lot of security tools, ultimately we don't use them in isolation, we combine them with other tools. And so having an API that's first class citizen available from the, the, the outset, um, architecting the startup so that the API is a, a first class citizen is hugely important. And then secondly, sort of building on that, um, 
every product will come with a fancy UI, super responsive, nice UI, nice dashboard. I have a million of these. I look at my core dashboards that I've built. I want to take data out of your product and I want to put it into my dashboard. So keeping this in mind, keeping, uh, keeping the fact that uh, going to your dashboard is, is causing me work, I want to take that data out and I want to put it in Tableau or I want to put it in Splunk. I want to uh, aggregate it with other data. So keeping that in mind, showing me that during demos, not just showing me the, the UI, but also showing me, and here's how other companies have combined it, aggregated that data, used it with other tools, demonstrating the value that way. That's fascinating. Um, so Kevin, would you say like, um, as you, you, you were talking about like you're very open to working with startups, have you figured out a way to run an RFP process where a startup can actually match up to what an incumbent is offering for a need that you're trying to meet? Um, <clears throat> no, so I don't. I don't. I like to be a bit more free flowing than have kind of a standardized uh, checklist, right? So, because there's there's just a lot of things that go into it beyond yeah. just the checklist of items, right? Perfect. So, so the the team, the CEO, the CTO, the, the members of that of that of that startup, mm -hmm. um, understanding are they realistic? Are they are they unrealistic? Um, mm -hmm. Understanding are they thinking about technology as well as security? Mm -hmm. um, APIs super important, uh, mm -hmm. especially for me. I was at MuleSoft for four years. Yeah, right, we're an yeah. API company, an integration <laughs> company, right? So. You don't say API, right? Like I'm not even gonna gonna talk to you, right? Yeah. Um, but really, um, I've been I've been doing it for a long time, and there's a lot of very specific areas that that, that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm looking to talk to talk to startups uh, that I that I want to solve a problem with, I'm gonna look at look for the look at, look for areas in in, uh, in those niches. Um, I've worked with a lot of VCs mm -hmm. um, uh, around to help find those, um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a you know symbiotic relationship. They right. come to me for advice, I come to them for advice, so. Um, but from a checklist perspective, no, uh, it's more it's more about you know um, what are you technology driven company? How are you trying to solve the problem? How are you trying to do something in a in a more innovative way um, that I haven't seen in the last you know twenty years? Um, and and is the team responsive? And, and can can we can you know can I will I be able to count on you? Are you really going to grow? Or are you going to fade away? Uh, you know into the sunset? You know so I kind of take all those all those factors into consideration, yeah. and then I'll try them out for a little while. Like I'll be a design partner with uh, with oh, awesome. them. I'll, I'll feed them a little bit of data here and there uh, to see to, to test them out. Mm -hmm. um, and if they kind of pass the, the real life tests mm -hmm. um, and not just checklist tests, right? It's got to be like real real life tests. And you, you get through there, and then uh, you know then you know I will you know. Buy your product, be your advisor, do 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 everything <laughs> because now you've kind of you've you've you've, 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 you've bought you know you've you've sold me so. Man, do you have like something very specific that you look for in startups as you go seeking to solve problems? Yeah, I think for me, what is one of the most important things is that I like to see startups that have behavior that aligns with all of us working together to achieve mm -hmm. one goal. So what I mean with that is that the. the Defensive cybersecurity is just very difficult to begin with, mm -hmm. and there are no set answers for every single problem. There are unsolved problems. They are challenging. So when I look at a company, one of the things I always do is try to figure out, like, how have they spoken about the problem mm -hmm. that they're trying to solve? If they use examples of companies making an error or doing something that doesn't end up leading to a good result as a way to sell their product, that usually ends up being something that really turns me off and makes mm -hmm. me less excited to go and work with them. So I really look for sort of the ethics behind mm -hmm. how the company behaves in the in the market space. The second thing I also really look for is really that very first explanation on how the product works. Like I always I try to sort of have a very practical approach to getting startups in the door because mm -hmm. I know it's very difficult for them to reach out. So I actually try to set aside like one hour every week that I try to start uh, talking to a company. And I try in that one hour to really get a good understanding of what is it that they're doing and what problem do they solve. If in that conversation I get an idea that it's going to work, mm -hmm. even though I might not understand the exact technical details, if I feel that good instinct, this is something that seems like it will work, I will usually be interested in continuing the conversation. Mm. Um, if during that hour or uh, 30 minutes, it's usually actually, I don't get the impression that it's going to work, then quite often I just usually try and cut it off right there. Mm. Because I think it's really important that I also take their time very respectfully because usually the companies that I end up moving forward with end up being the companies that dedicate some really senior technical resources to having that initial conversation. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to waste their time too much. So usually after 30 minutes, I have an idea of whether it's worth continuing the conversation or whether this is one where I should really tell them like, no, this isn't it this time. And maybe come back if D 
these and these things change or maybe if our needs change in some way in the future. So I think that's really important, like that behavior of those startups that they really treat cybersecurity as something we're all trying to solve together. And second, that they send the right people to really be able to tell me exactly what the solution does so I have a good idea of where it fits into my security program. I mean, I'm pretty sure like anybody who watches this video later is going to be like, hey, what is that one hour time slot? <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how, do I, how do I get on that? <laughs> well, if they think they have a great product, they're always welcome to send me an email. And usually when I hear something I like, I'll try to make time. It might be quite a while off, but uh, <laughs> I, do, I do really enjoy talking to companies that bring new technical ideas to the foreground. No, it's, it's awesome that you're doing that. How about you, Rinky? Like, it, it, what is your current process of engaging with uh, startups and what are you looking from them when you're actually engaging them? Yeah, it's interesting because I think what all these guys said, I agree with, you know, and I, the way that I think about this is when I'm doing business with a startup, it's a two-way investment, right? I'm definitely investing my time, my money, my resources, yeah. and sometimes you know, they may not even have a fully working prototype, and so you're really helping them test. Um, and obviously they're making an investment as well because they're going to try to customize and do things for you. And so for me, I think at the end of the day, with any startup, it's been the team of people that they bring to the table. And that's what that's all it is, because there's so many like, what did you say, 4000 something yeah. vendors out there? There's so many duplicate technologies. So yeah. how do you decide? And it's generally comes down to the people, right? Mm -hmm. Do they want to build a relationship with me? Do they want to strategically grow with me? And you know, I have a soft spot for startups too because hopefully maybe one day I'll have my own product and I understand it's really hard to get your foot in the door and that you know once and so how are they showing up to have that relationship understand what my challenges are and then build with me right mm -hmm. so um, that's kind of how I think about it um, the one you know the couple bad experiences mm -hmm. I've had um, there's a few vendors that I've worked with that you know even they, they've come out of stealth mode or that they're um, you know they're very new startups with a working prototype and they're leveraging their relationships to come and then test in in, in our environment yeah, yeah. and rather than treating me as the customer it's like they feel like it's their right to come in because the because yeah. of this relationship that they have um, and they're not coming in and um, trying to you know really being uh, treating me as the customer and it's so you know I'll do I will help them but am I going to be a long term customer are they thinking about it strategically absolutely not and so that's definitely not the way to do it leverage your uh, relationships to get your foot in the door as a startup but then after that it. it's it's on that relationship that's really going to matter for the long term fascinating i think uh kind of brings me to like like the more important part of like how should startups be uh, collaborating right like I think like what is the mantra here like should people invest like one or two years to building a product in stealth mode and then coming out and saying hey would you like to use the solution of ours right because like in most of those conversations it's a little too late right because they've actually built something and the market who was looking for a solution maybe over two years has matured their thought process on what they actually need to be settling for right so as you think about like your uh, openness on wanting to work with startups, are you designing a process, right? And when I say designing a process, do you have it in you, like you said, like you might start your own company, right? And you draw inspiration from some of these companies. What's a working relationship where you can help someone who's coming out tomorrow? And we know like what's happening at Semantic, right? Like a lot of entrepreneurs are gonna come out of that, uh, you know, activity of like Broadcom buying him. Do you actively want to pursue a way where you can actually add value to these people day one? Like when I say day one, as in like, hey, sharp group of people, but they're looking for the problem to solve. And I, I think Jim Ruth has done a pretty good job of like bringing in guys and saying like, hey, here's the problem I have. I haven't heard a lot of people solving this problem. Why don't you work with my people and solve it? Do you aspire to do some of that? And like, and and part of what I'm also trying to hear is like, there's a risk which we want to talk about, right? About working with startups, right? I mean, your jobs, like the average tenure of a CISO is like sub two years, right? Which to me is like, wow, like, you know, uh, in that fluid uh, responsibility that you have to carry for a board, like, you know, private company, public company, 
you need to be thinking about the repercussions of even engaging working with these startups, right? And so how do you best control that mechanism? Like, do you, uh, do you want to be working with people, like you said, like who are early partners, who are designing solutions just for you, right? And what does that process look like as you evolve? Because like there are so many problems to solve. And so where I'd love to start it is like, do you have a problem today which is unmet that you would want to solve? Right, that two people coming out of a company can actually hit you up and say like, hey, I heard that you're trying to solve this problem. Would you spend half an hour with me and let me give you my background on why I would be the best person to be building a solution? Could you each talk about like a problem that you have where you've not spotted what you need, where you might have a willingness to actually work with an early stage team? Is that a fair question? So Rinki. Yeah, there's a couple areas I can say that um, not necessarily where it's a, a problem that I didn't even know existed, but um, like email security is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of vendors and it feels, still feels like the problem hasn't been solved around email security. That's an interesting one that where there's a lot of companies emerging, right. right? And there's a lot of companies thinking about different ways to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I did test with a company where they were I think we were not even customer. We were company number one that they were working with. Oh, wow. um, and and it was, again, team of smart people that uh, wanted to do the right thing and then wanted to solve a problem that they had a unique twist on. But it was they were working with five companies and just big companies. Mm -hmm. And they got their foot in the door again because of who they were and the way that team came together. Really impressive uh, folks. And they were working with us to test in our environment, which was, I think, the way to do it. And now they've got five big companies mm. that can they can now, when they're ready to, uh, you know, go out and sell, they can say these five companies are we've been working with them to even develop this product, which I think is the right way to do it. So almost like a design partner, you were like an early design partner. Design to, feedback yes. advisor, everything, but they had something to show too. Awesome. So it was it was mutually beneficial. But that was in its. Uh, you started by saying email security is like kind of not very well solved for. Yeah. But should we take away that email security was a problem that this company is trying to so help you solve? That's right. right. Email okay. security, but also bringing in other components to it. Like, can we do user education as Perfect. a part of it, and yep. other parts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that they were uh, bringing into the mix? So a, a, a different way of thinking about it. I got you. That's awesome, Martin. How about you? So I kind of heard two questions, and uh, one of them is like what spaces are you interested in? Mm -hmm. The second is like, how do you mitigate the risk of working with a company yep. that's really young and where you might run into challenges? And instead of like contributing <laughs> one space, I'll share with you one technique that I kind of use to try and identify spaces where startups could be really beneficial. Oh, that'd be um, awesome. And for me, a technique that I tend to use is I, I always try to have not more than one company in a specific space chaining together. So for instance, if you look at email security, it becomes really challenging when you have like three different vendors doing mm -hmm. things with your email and increases risks, it makes things more difficult. So I kind of look for spaces where you have security features becoming sort of the standard of the SaaS service that you use for the particular feature. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you see Google, Microsoft implementing more of these yep. baseline security features in the base product, mm -hmm. so that you can really start focusing on the couple of problems that go sort of beyond that baseline that you want to solve. And that then becomes a really interesting space for a startup because maybe you don't actually need the really fully fledged solution you have in that space. You can use the baseline SaaS security features mm -hmm. and then just use the startup to accommodate or address the risks that you have that you know that are still there. So that's sort of a technique that I can have tried to use it works for email works a little bit in identity there's different areas where I think there's really fruitful place for mm -hmm. startups to really start building in terms of risk this is actually a big one for me because I, I had one bad experience with a startup where the startup essentially was acquired and shut down with very little heads up causing mm -hmm. quite a bit of impact mm -hmm. um, it at, uh, at a certain point in time uh, when I was working with them. And so something I always go and try and look for is things that mitigate anything happening to the startup. Mm -hmm. And examples of that can include maybe a startup that shares some of their intellectual property as open source code, which at least gives us some ability to sort of mitigate around it, even though it would be very expensive. Um, a second thing I go and look for is startups that actually realize that they want to limit the amount of access that they have. If a startup comes in and they solve every problem, but they mm -hmm. need read-write access to all of my data, mm -hmm. I'm going to be very, very hesitant to go mm -hmm. and work with them. But if they can limit that to read access or they limit the amount of changes they can make in an hour, the impact of something happening with the startup would be a lot lower. So I always 
try to have a conversation with these companies about how do you actually reduce the threat that you may pose to our enterprise network yeah. because in the end they're small companies they don't have the ability to hire a lot of security talent yeah. it might be a little bit counterintuitive mm -hmm. but security companies are not always <laughs> Um, product security companies and that they build a secure product. So um, I try to acknowledge that, mm -hmm. realize that, and then work with the company to understand what they can build in that makes their situation a little bit or their product a little bit less risky for me to go and use. That's an awesome example, by the way. Kevin, uh, are there things that you're looking for when uh, you're thinking about contributing to an early stage startup that you were talking about, like you do? <coughs> Yeah, there, there's a couple different things. So um, I generally start out with with a with you know kind of a, a strategy on security and how I'm going to go. The last three mm -hmm. companies I kind of started security from the ground up, right? So there's kind of certain table stakes that I want to want to get put in place, um, and then there's certain areas where I know based on the business and based on how the business is going that you know I would like uh, possibly a better solution there. Mm -hmm. uh, I may need something right now, uh, mm -hmm. but then I may go go to the thing that's a bit a bit more right now, but doesn't give me what I need. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I have something in place, then I'll be willing to be a design partner for somebody to work on work on something to get me where I need to get to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've got a one that I've been recently. It's mm -hmm. kind of that I've been working towards is that, uh, um, and it's kind of kind of in the news a lot. You know, there's lots of these BI tools. Mm -hmm. uh, whether those BI tools are Looker and Tableau mm -hmm. and, and Whatever, whatever else, there's a ton of these cloud-based based BI tools, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, looking for innovative ways to, to be able to, to restrict data, you know, and do, do things in line to be able to restrict sensitive data before it goes out, mm -hmm. um, rather than making handshake deals with engineering and our data teams to say like, oh, we promise this data will never go to the cloud, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right? Like, we, I need preventive measures in place mm -hmm. and alerting measures in place and, and automatic things in place to, to verify that those things don't happen. Um, and there's lots of tools that kind of do some mm -hmm. of this stuff, but there's mm -hmm. no tool that kind of does what I want, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's something that you know I've got things in place right now. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's not to the to the level that I want want to do. So, um, you know, I'll talk to some design partners about that. Like, hey, where can we work together mm -hmm. on solving this particular particular problem? That's a kind of a really specific example. Yeah, no, I mean that's awesome. Right so, now on. this is more like around like uh, the privacy of data, like people. Uh, just increasing the value of like user data, yep. right? And the user could be your employee versus also like your customer, right? Both, exactly, yeah. yeah. And privacy should be an end result, right? Like yep. my goal yep. isn't yep. privacy, my mm -hmm. goal is information security, security. Yep. and securing data. Uh, and if we do it right, then privacy is privacy. a byproduct of yes. doing a good job. That's awesome. How about you, John? So I take a similar approach to Kevin in that when you're building a security program from scratch, you need to get the basics in place and then once they're in place across your program, it's an opportunity to then revisit areas where uh, you think you can strengthen. So one of those areas I feel is uh, application security, so security and CI/CD. So having spoken to, uh, which, is, which actually is a favorite topic of mine, and having spoken to uh, many of uh, my peers in the industry, I don't think I've ever met anyone that is thoroughly happy with their solution, whether it be a homegrown solution, open source solution, or a commercial solution. So this is kind of telling. Uh, a lot of the tools that we're using um, kind of predate the DevOps era. They are um, kind of slow, lots of false positives. They don't, we haven't quite figured out how to do security at scale for engineering and kind of remove se the security team from that loop. I don't want to be on every ticket, every email. That yeah. doesn't scale. I want to empower the developers. But how do we train those developers? How do we then um, put the tools in their hands and allow them to run with it? So I think that's a really interesting area. And then the second space I'll call out is uh, cloud security. So a you know, big topic here. Um, I would say that we're in the infancy of cloud security tools. So there's uh, multiple vendors that can uh, scan my AWS configuration and give me a list of everything that's wrong with it. They can tell me all of the security rules I've set up that allow port 22 from the internet. Um, but that doesn't really, and, and so I'll end up with a massive list, list of these things to do. Uh, depending on the AWS account, but that doesn't really help me prioritize. Like we need to start in fact, layering in other constraints. So um, how sensitive are these systems? What are they connected to? What's the blast radius if one of these systems got compromised? So I kind of feel we're at the infancy of cloud security. I'm really um, looking forward to, to um, seeing what happens in that space. And it's, um, I think it's a solvable problem in that uh, the data that we are getting from the cloud, it's, uh, we can analyze that data programmatically. So one of the uh, really sort of historic problems with physical infrastructure is asset management. 
that should be easy in the cloud, right? The cloud won't lie if I say, give me a list of all of the VMs that we have. So I kind of feel that the, the basics are in place, the data is there, now I'm looking for um, some vendors to do some, some smart things with it. That's awesome. Dave, can you close us out on? Yeah, I'm actually gonna piggyback on what John just said because uh, with the, the cloud compute, you know, asset management becomes really challenging when your entire stack is ephemeral, right? So you have things that are spinning up and down on demand. You don't have that traditional model like we've seen before where you just go and scan something that's static or you spin something up and take it down. These things are by design to be destroyed and rebuilt almost on the fly. So I agree, there's, there's a lot of innovation that I think has yet to really come out of this space. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, one of the things that I would encourage with the community for startups is that, you know, much like Rinkia, I also take an advisory role with the startups I work with. Don't try to solve the problem on your own, right? There's a lot of companies, you have 4,000 out there, right? You've got to admit there's probably at least a dozen that are doing something similar. Use it as an opportunity to find partnerships, whether it's with competitors or perceived competitors or, or true partners. I think you'll get mm. a lot better economy of scale in how you build your product and you'll also get valuable feedback on maybe you're not even on the right track. And I think with a lot of the companies that are really focused on vulnerability management in general, especially with the cloud, the old approach doesn't work. So you're either going to have to innovate it yourself or find someone else who's doing it, which just creates more opportunity for companies to work together. And I think that's really the key in, in why we look at startups in general is that because there's agility there, you can decrease the amount of time it takes to actually get to that innovation stage. And so by a show of hands, uh, how many of you are willing to be advisors to cybersecurity startups? Yeah. All right, so great crowd, fascinating conversations. I'll open it up for the audience if they have questions. We have a few more minutes where we can take them. Yeah. Hi, I'm Munawar uh, from, uh, do I have to stand or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Munawar from Open Your Factory. So I come, I'm the CEO of a very small startup, and the most uh, the important problem that the startups have is the resource, obviously. And uh, every company is different, like five of you, if I go try to sell my product to five of you, I have to look into five different systems. We are a SaaS, uh, we are a SaaS company, uh, we are uh, providing uh, a solution for automatically fixing your security problems, not only detecting. Uh, so. But if I go to, uh, I have to scan the source code, if I go to five of your companies, you have five different build systems, uh, all sorts of different stuff. So how, how much tolerant are you guys when, uh, like for example, if I'm mean, uh, communicating with one of you about like we would need some uh, time to customize our, uh, uh, like our software to uh, meet with, uh, with you guys. So we talked about like design partnership uh, but this is a little bit more than that. I mean, we are, uh, for example, a little bit more mature. We have already a product that's built. So, but we need time to set things up. So typically when you engage, like you set aside maybe like five months of time or two months of time or like one week and you're out. Uh, what's, the, what's the time level that... Uh, can, can I start with this? Yeah, so the, the key for us is that it's the ease of deployment, right? So generally where we see a lot of the, the startups fall down is that they don't have kind of the one click button push to, to deploy the product, which means I have to dedicate my time and my resources to help you get to where you need. Not opposed to that, but you have to kind of balance that with the, the project timelines and the roadmaps that we have. So if it's gonna be you know a couple of weeks, we can tolerate it generally. If it's a couple of months, probably not so much. Sure. Yeah, and I think Kevin mentioned this earlier, but I think if it's a critical need for my company, I'm, I, you know, I'm also uh, I'm building security ground up, and if it's a critical need for my company right now, that's not that's not where I'm going to go look for a design partner. That's probably someone that's very well established. You know, I'm going to come and bring it in place. So generally, when I'm partnering with someone to design a product. I don't have a time frame in mind. It's okay if it takes a long time. It's not one week or two months or six months. It's, you know, let's work on this together. So it's also you having a need looking into a longer horizon. Exactly, exactly. This might be beneficial. It's a strategic, it's a strategic partnership. And so it's, it, I wouldn't be doing a design partnership with something I need right now. Yeah, and yeah. it would be more long term and it would, it should be mutually beneficial. One thing I would also add, and um, 
This is something that isn't visible from the outside of a company, but you can make some assumptions, is that quite often it really also depends on the amount of resources that we have in this specific space to experiment. So for instance, in many companies, application security is always sort of a pain point in terms of bandwidth and the amount of people that you have. So it's often very difficult to get some of that creative space from a company in that area. So if you're targeting a company in an area where you know there's sort of a talent crunch, it's good to think ahead of time about how are you going to integrate really, really quickly because companies will have less of a tolerance to work with you and try to do an implementation. If you're in an area where there's plenty of talent and companies have no issues hiring, they have no open job recs uh, on their website in that area or they're very short-lived, you might have a lot more time and place to, to, to play in with that company before you actually get to a point where you can fully integrate. So I know that's all an easy thing to assess and often it's actually really good to just ask the companies that you're working with and they're going to be pretty open with you on what their capabilities are in different areas so if you have a, a product that does something in multiple spaces maybe you can find a space where maybe the need is a little bit lower but the capacity to try it is, is a bit higher and if it works out well there you can then move it to other parts of the business Thanks. Hi my name is Shlomi Gian I'm the CEO of uh, Cyber Ready. we focus on uh, awareness uh, training employees and uh, selfish question is, is you know what, what, what I really liked was the question about you know how do you decide where to work with startup that the response I've heard was uh, you know we, we see holes some some places that will be dated uh, that's where we go and look for faster solution to a startup so we're willing to take the risk if there's a hole to put. Uh, what's your take on awareness security awareness training I think uh, this. Um, so I think that was a, uh, a good area where historically a lot of companies have a hole. I think the challenge for us all now is that uh, it's a really crowded market space yeah. now. Yeah. So um, basically figuring out the vendors that can offer something different other than, hey, we have our computer-based training and uh, you know, these the sort of um, uh, the, the death by uh, training videos that people click through trying to get through as fast as possible. So it's really looking for the vendors that uh, are offering something different in that space. I think the differentiation is, is the key. So you still, you think there's still place for innovation despite the crowded market? Uh, absolutely. I think um, we're probably in the infancy of figuring out how to improve security awareness. I mean, it's certainly not a, a solved problem. If uh, any one of us, uh, I'm sure we'd all agree that uh, you know, security awareness is something we really would love to improve and uh, open to working with vendors to do. Yeah, I think I, the stat is something like 95 or 98 percent of breaches start because of some kind of yep. user behavior issue. Uh, I think the big challenge is that, on and this is a passion area of mine around security education and awareness, that phishing testing is proven, right? Um, and you see behavior change and you see metrics behind it. But for all the other areas around data sharing, there's new things that are coming and it's coming through technology that you have that can do prevention, right? For, hey, you don't want something to be uploaded into box and they can real time train you. But I think more things like that where you can measure actual behavior change and report on it, I think <coughs> that's still missing. And you know, video training and all that kind of stuff, I don't even consider that as a part of my education and awareness programs, more check the box compliance, and you know, legal can own that, but as a part of user behavior change, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and I don't see a solve for it yet. Agreed, yeah, I'll just, you know, um, traditionally it's been a compliance-driven initiative, right, like, hey, you gotta check the box and do your, do your, you know, take your annual, you know, I was in the government for a long time, right, I took the same, Two hour long video for like 15 years like it sucked uh, and uh, you know so it's 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 just, it's about learning right and and I think is when you have sometimes we talked about like security professionals trying to build a security product um, you know they're not the best product people but they're pretty good at security um, probably the very same thing that we have going on in security awareness um, probably need some more people that are focused on education focused on especially um, as as people are changing, as as millennials that we have a lot in the business place, even location wise, like somebody in Europe or China or the or, or Florida or California, there's different types of learning styles and different types of capabilities. And if we keep saying that there's going to be one size that fits all to be able to solve these problems, then then uh, we're going to continue to fail at being able to educate people appropriately. I think from my perspective, one thing I really look for um, in security awareness products is moving away from the idea that we can actually teach people when we want to teach them. Um, because 
every one of our employees gets so much information on a daily basis, they can't refocus and focus on security for a little bit. So a few years ago, uh, Netflix released this project, I think it was called Stetoscope, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. which was sort of pivoting that idea and thinking about like, how do we actually teach individuals when they're making a mistake? And I think that's something I really look for. And it's very difficult to build because it needs to integrate with all of your business processes. But I kind of want an employee, when they're doing something that is unsafe, rather than just outright blocking them without information, for them to use that moment to learn a little bit about why they shouldn't be doing it and what risks they're exposing to the company. And that also gives us those statistics, that data um, around what the behaviors are that we need to go and, and educate on. So I think I agree with everyone. There's a lot of potential there. Um, I think there's still a lot that has sort of been unexplored and probably that's because it is so difficult to integrate with all of the different tools that a company uses. But if someone can solve that problem, I think that's sort of the golden nugget that will really help us move forward there. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback on top of that, I think it's in the, the data protection space specifically. So if you think about DLP and a lot of things happening mm -hmm. with privacy and GDPR, you know, we have uh, alerts that will trigger based upon policy violations. If I could inline take that context and then drive some kind of you know quick little one minute, two minute video, whatever, which shows why it's important to follow the policy with the awareness training in line with the actual violation, that is a green field right now. It's like training a dog. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, with that, I think uh, we'll bring the panel to a close. Thank you all for your generous time allocation today.